Thank you for joining us today on Netfile. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kassim. Humanity is waging war on nature. This is senseless and suicidal. Those are words of UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently. And in truth, humanity's environmental challenges have grown in number and severity ever since the Stockholm Conference in 1972 and now represent a planetary emergency. Why tackling the emergency is demanding a new report, making peace with nature, lights a path to a sustainable future with new possibilities and opportunities. Today, we'll take a look at the solutions experts have developed in this blueprint. Do stay with us. The United Nations Environment Programme has long warned that the per capita stock of natural capital which is referring to the resources and services nature provides to humanity, has fallen 40% in just over two decades. And we know that a staggering 9 out of 10 people worldwide breathe polluted air. In a recent study, it was found that pollution from fossil fuels causes 1 in 5 premature deaths globally, suggesting the health impact of burning coal oil and natural gas may be far higher than previously thought. So what we did is we combined a statistical model that tells us about the relationship between um, air pollution concentrations and premature mortality that was derived by the Harvard School of Public Health with a simulation of air pollution, where the simulation tells us about all the detailed processes that happen in the atmosphere leading to the formation of air pollution. And so what we could do with the simulation is tease out the contribution from fossil fuel combustion. And so when we combined those two tools, we estimated premature mortality that's much greater than previously reported. Parts of China, India, Europe, and the northeastern United States are among the hardest hit areas, suffering a disproportionately high share of 8.7 million annual deaths attributed to fossil fuels. So we estimate just from the just from fossil fuel combustion that there are 8.7 million premature deaths each year. Research in 2017 had put the annual number of deaths from all outdoor air particulate matter, including dust and smoke from agricultural burns and wildfires, at 4.2 million. The hotspots that stand out um, are in China and India. Um, and then there are also some uh, locations in the U.S., like the northeast U.S., where there's a lot of um, fossil fuel combustion, um, and then in a few spots in Europe as well. But the two countries that stand out as hotspots are China and India. Previous research based on satellite data and ground observations had struggled to distinguish pollution caused by burning fossil fuels from other sources of harmful particulate such as wildfires or dust. A team from three British universities and Harvard University sought to overcome this problem by using a high-resolution model to give a clearer indication of which kinds of pollutants people were breathing in a particular area. This is an extraordinarily high estimate. We, we were also sort of blown away by um, just how large the estimate was that we obtained. Um, but, you know, our study certainly isn't in, in isolation in finding a large um, impact on health due to exposure to air pollution. There are studies that are with these statistical models that I mentioned, also incorporating more and more information about adverse health outcomes associated with air pollution and um, tending towards a higher estimate of premature mortality. Uh, there are many studies that look at um, health consequences associated with air pollution and finding more and more um, adverse health outcomes. I mean, loss of eyesight, cognitive um, ability, um, de dementia. You know, there's so many studies that it's um, the consensus is really that air pollution is worse for health than we originally thought. With concern growing over the role that burning fossil fuels plays in causing climate change. The authors said they hoped the study, based on data from 2018, would provide further impetus for governments to accelerate a shift to cleaner energy. What we want is certainly more, um, you know, a greater, it to become an incentive for transitioning to cleaner sources of energy, but also, you know, 
making that transition more urgent than it than it perhaps is. We're showing that there is this really large near-term impact of fossil fuels on health. There are many complementary uh, climate studies that are showing that there's going to be an adverse long-term effect of fossil fuels on climate. You know, with this combined information, we really think it should be a more urgent transition. Yeah. In 2020, the United Nations Environment Program announced that despite a dip in greenhouse gas emissions caused by the pandemic, the world is still headed for global warming of more than 3 degrees Celsius this century. To guide decision makers toward the action required, the UN has released the Making Peace with Nature report. The report puts together all the evidence of environmental decline from major global scientific assessments with the most advanced ideas on how to reverse it. The result is a blueprint for a sustainable future that can secure human well-being on a healthy planet. The result is three interlinked environmental crises, climate disruption, biodiversity loss and pollution that threaten our viability as a species. And they are caused by unsustainable production and consumption. Human well-being lies in protecting the health of the planet, and it's time to reevaluate and reset our relationship with nature. Among the recommendations was that more than $5 trillion in annual subsidies to sectors such as fossil fuels and industrial agriculture, fishing and mining should be redirected to accelerate a shift to a low carbon future and restore nature. Governments should also look beyond economic growth as an indicator of performance and take account of the value of preserving ecosystems. It aims to encourage governments to take more ambitious steps at a UN climate conference in Glasgow in November and join parallel talks to, to agree a the, new global pact on preserving biodiversity. I think 2021 is a make it or break it year. We are not too late, but we need to make sure that uh, we are able uh, not only uh, to um, uh, create the conditions for a drastic reduction of emissions in the horizon of the next decade, making it possible to achieve the limit of 1.5 degrees. This is the year where we need to have a new framework to preserve biodiversity. And this is the year where we need to take a number of very important measures to reduce pollution. I mean, it's a make it or break it year, indeed, because the risks of things becoming irreversible is gaining ground every single year. Today around the world, we are overexploiting and degrading the environment on land and sea. The atmosphere and the oceans have become dumping grounds for our waste. And governments are still paying more to exploit nature than to protect it. Globally, countries spend more, some four to six trillion dollars a year on subsidies that damage the environment. More than one million of the planet's estimated eight million plant and animal species are at risk of extinction. And diseases caused by air pollution cause some 6.5 million premature deaths every year, and polluted water kills a further 1.8 million predominantly children. With countries launching economic recovery packages in response to the coronavirus pandemic, the authors hope their policy prescriptions will encourage more coordinated action to rapidly transform destructive industrial and financial systems. It's very clear that we depend on nature and unfortunately we're over-exploiting it at the moment. So I think more and more governments are starting to recognise that they have to rethink how to measure economic growth. That doesn't mean to say they'll do away with GDP. I think they'll complement GDP, but when they try to think about where are we going, they'll look at GDP, but they will also look what is happening to inclusive wealth. So I think they need to look at both of the uh, parameters at the same time. The report spotlighted the importance of changing mindsets to find political and technical solutions that equal the environmental crisis. We are 
close to a point of no return. Uh, um, it is obvious that, uh, um, uh, just to give an example, temperature rise has already reached 1.2 degrees. So if we want to keep it to 1.5 until the end of the century, it is clear that we are very close to the point of no return. Placing our own health and prosperity the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme says our environmental, social and economic Crucially, challenges we can are interlinked. So they must therefore be tackled together. Um, now, this new report, as we've just heard from UNEP, Making Peace with Nature, provides the most compelling scientific case yet for why we have to tackle the three planetary crises that we just heard the Secretary General outline, climate, nature, and pollution. And we have to uh, tackle them as one linked challenge. The report gathers the sum of knowledge from major scientific assessments to deliver one clear and unified message. We're destroying the planet, placing our own health and prosperity at risk. She says we cannot achieve the sustainable development goals, including ending poverty by 2030, if climate change and ecosystem collapse are undermining food and water supplies in the world's poorest countries. She concluded that we have no choice but to transform our economies and societies by valuing nature and putting its health at the heart of all our decisions. Crucially, we can achieve rapid progress by addressing the three crises together, not in fragmentation. The meeting in Paris requires a rapid transformation in energy systems, in land use, in agriculture, in forest protection, and in urban development and infrastructure and lifestyles, all of which would have positive impact on climate, on pollution, and on biodiversity. There is indeed no precedent for what we have to do. But if 2020 was a disaster, let 2021 then be the year when humanity began making peace with nature and secured a fair, just, and sustainable future for everyone. Making peace with nature draws on global assessments, including those from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, United Nations Environment Programme reports and new findings on the emergence of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. Almost one in four or one in five premature deaths that occur every day, every month, every year on our planet are actually caused by ourselves. That is in judicial terms sometimes called manslaughter or murder. Um, very often people may not even have realized that when they found a substance or a technology that seemed to offer enormous advantages that it would one day contribute to the over 12 million premature deaths a year. Researchers studying the impact of emissions from industry and transport on climate change and human health are scrambling to understand the possible implications of the coronavirus pandemic as economies slow, flight are disrupted and quarantines imposed. Spectrometers are measuring in different uh, parts of the uh, electromagnetic uh, spectrum. In this particular case, we are having uh, measurements, so we are taking measurements in the ultraviolet, in the visible, the near infrared, and the short wave in infrared. And there are absorption bands of uh, NO2, and that allows us, therefore, to measure the concentration of uh, NO2 uh, in, in the atmosphere. Confirming the likely impact of increased emissions on average global temperature rise since the industrial era, the WMO Secretary General said that the world was moving towards the 3 to 5 degrees Celsius warming by the end of this century instead of 1.5 to 2, which was the Paris Agreement target. For many communities, the issue is not so much temperature increases as more extreme weather events. We are moving towards 3 to 5 degrees warming by, this, uh, this, uh, by the end of this century. Uh, instead of uh, 1.5 to 2, which was the Paris, uh, Paris uh, target. The main impact uh, so far and, and also by the end of this century is coming from the changes in rainfall patterns. And, um, and uh, we have uh, started seeing already some of the regions to become more dry, especially Africa and some parts of, uh, of Asia and, and some parts of uh, Americas. And uh, that's having even bigger impact than the temperature changes before us. So I'm going to hand over now. On Tuesday, February 24th, 2021, we are today. British naturalist Sir David Attenborough 
warned world leaders that climate change is the biggest security threat that modern humans have ever faced, telling the UN Security Council. We are today perilously close to tipping points that once passed will send global temperatures spiraling catastrophically higher. If we continue on our current path, we will face the collapse of everything that gives us our security. Food production, access to fresh water, habitable ambient temperature, and ocean food chains. And if the natural world can no longer support the most basic of our needs, then much of the rest of civilization will quickly break down. Please make no mistake. Climate change is the biggest threat to security that modern humans have ever faced. I don't envy you the responsibility that this places on all of you and your governments. We have left the stable and secure climatic period that gave birth to our civilizations. There is no going back. No matter what we do now, it's too late to avoid climate change. And the poorest and most vulnerable, those with the least security, are now certain to suffer. With the world struggling to cut planet warming emissions fast enough to avoid catastrophic warming, the United Nations will stage a climate summit in November in Glasgow, Scotland. It will be the most important gathering since the 2015 event that yielded the Paris Agreement, when nearly 200 countries committed to halt rising temperatures quickly enough to avoid catastrophic change. The November summit serves as a deadline for countries to commit to deeper emissions cuts. Last year, we passed a law uh, committing us in the UK to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And uh, we've pledged to uh, slash emissions by 68% uh, by 2030. That's the steepest reduction for any major economy. And our climate finance commitments for the next five years, supporting the rest of the world to achieve this, stand at 11.6 billion pounds. And ahead of the COP26 summit, we're going to be putting climate change firmly at the top of the agenda for our G7 presidency as well. So my message to you all today is now the UN Security Council has got to act too, because climate change is a geopolitical issue every bit as much as it is an environmental one. And if this council is going to succeed in maintaining peace and security worldwide, then it's got to galvanize the whole range of UN embassy, uh, agencies, organizations, uh, and into a swift and effective response. If we don't act now, when will we act? The Paris Accord aims to cap the rise in temperatures to well below 2 degrees Celsius, and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees Celsius to avoid the most devastating impact of climate change. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres pushed countries, companies, cities and financial institutions to make ambitious commitments to cut global emissions. China and the United States are the world's biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. We still have a long way to go. And we look to the major emitters to lead by example in the coming months. This is a credibility test of their commitment to people and planet. And it's the only way we will keep the 1.5 degree goal within reach. French President Emmanuel Macron advised that the United Nations Security Council should consider appointing a special envoy for climate security to coordinate the Council's efforts in this area. Clearly, the link between climate and security, if complex, 
is undeniable, in some ways inexorable. According to what's written of the 20 countries the most affected by conflicts in the world, 12 are also amongst the most vulnerable to the impact of climate change. Et très clairement, un échec sur le front du climat s'apprête les efforts de prévention des conflits Clearly, et de consolidation. A failure on the climate front calls for conflict prevention and peace building efforts. De, de ces That's why I support the initiative of taking up these issues de with the Security Council as part of its mandate donc, of maintaining vous, vous peace and international security. De prévention et d'efficacité qui justifie. You see, it's a structured agenda, an agenda of prevention and effectiveness, which justifies that it is on one hand taken up by the Security Council, and on the other hand, justifies us supporting the nomination of a special envoy for climate security. Representative of the However, Russia and China questioned whether the Security Council is the right forum to be discussing climate change. We agree that climate change and environmental issues can exacerbate conflict. But are they really the root cause of these conflicts? There are serious doubts about this. We need to vigorously pursue sustainable development. Climate change is in essence a development issue. Sustainable development holds the master key to solving all problems and eliminating the root causes of conflict. The international community should help the countries in conflict regions, least developed countries and small island developing states to build capacity for development. Countries are encouraged to make climate response part of their economic and social development plans and take multi-pronged measures for parallel and coordinated progress in economic growth, poverty reduction, job creation, health promotion, ecological conservation and climate response. U.S. climate envoy John Kerry warned that climate change is the biggest security threat that modern humans have ever faced. Some argue that climate change isn't the business of the U.N. Security Council. Well, we could only wish that that were true. But the fact is, the climate threat is so massive, so multifaceted, that it's impossible to disentangle it from other challenges that the Security Council faces. We bury our heads in the sand at our own peril. It is time to start treating the climate crisis like the urgent security threat that it is. This is literally the challenge of all of our generations. Meanwhile, on Monday, the 23rd of February, the day before the UN Security Council meeting, the fifth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly kicked off, calling for concerted efforts to restore the health of ecosystems and secure a post-COVID-19 future that is resilient, inclusive and prosperous. The 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity will be held in Kunming City of Southwest China, in May this year. China's Minister of Ecology and Environment was the first to speak during the leadership dialogue on the first day of the assembly. The minister said that as the host country, China is actively preparing for the convention in accordance with the overall arrangement made by the Secretariat. No country can solve global environmental problems by acting alone. We must take global actions, global response and global cooperation. China is ready to share its experience with the international community, take positive actions together and make greater contribution to building a community of life on Earth where man and nature live in harmony. As the world's highest decision-making body on the environment, the United Nations Environment Assembly is held every two years with the aim of galvanizing global collective action to tackle challenges such as climate change, pollution, and ecosystem degradation. Affected by the pandemic, the fifth edition was held online from February 22nd to the 23rd and will be held offline in February 2022 at the United Nations Environment Program headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya. For years, 
scientists have detailed how humanity is degrading Earth and its natural systems. Yet the actions we are taking from government and financial institutions to businesses and individuals fall far short of what is needed to protect current and future generations from a hothouse Earth beset by mass species extinctions and poisonous air and water. Finding answers to such daunting problems is complex. It takes time, but experts have developed solutions and we have been told there are no excuses. The time to act is now. That's our show for the week. Thank you for watching. We hope to be back with you next week from all of us here in Lagos. It's bye for now.